If you want to see how we completely transform this railing from this to this, if you want to learn how to do it, keep on watching. Let it started. This small drywall railing served its purpose for decades, but it's not the 1960s anymore, and having this railing completely covered with drywall makes the space feel enclosed, and we wanna open up the entire area, which starts, of course, with our trusty old sledgehammer. I was fairly positive that there was no electrical or plumbing in any of these walls because seemingly nothing was running through the space. However, I have seen weirder things before opening up walls, which is why I took a sledgehammer and not my reciprocating saw first before I cut into this space. Once I could guarantee that there was no electrical and plumbing, I took off the top cap and used my reciprocating saw to completely demolish this small little wall in no time at all. This wall is just made up of 2x4s and two layers of drywall with a few nails built into it, so that makes removing this entire system extremely easy as long as you have the right blade. This blade can go through wood as well as nails, and it's actually quite satisfying to remove these walls section by section. There's a 2x4 base plate that you can see right here that I'm actually keeping in place, and I'll take care of that later on in the video. As we make our way to the stairwell, there is a key element with this part because I'm actually using a 2x4 to trace a line where I want the cut to be placed. And this does two things for me, it allows me to rest my blade right up against the 2x4, making it a lot easier to cut that direction, and two, providing the proper angle to go down the stairwell evenly and consistently all the way down. Okay, I can't say evenly because it is a reciprocating saw and it's not the best blade to use when trying to get a perfectly straight cut, but it does the job and you'll see how I fix up the drywall later on in the video. This is a considerably high space, especially with no railing, which is why I'm actually setting up some temporary supports to guarantee that no one hurts themselves because the homeowner requested that I remove this railing first before they start installing all the flooring. I did not install this flooring, but if you do want to see how it's installed properly, I do have a few videos on that, whether it's nailed down or glue down. I'll make sure and leave a link for those below. For railing, one of the most important parts is to make sure it's structurally sound and can hold a considerable amount of weight. And with the fact that we removed all the 2x4s and the majority of the framing, we need to make sure that we beef up the existing base before we install our new railing. This 4x4 blocking is exactly what we need in this circumstance, and I'm using 6 inch long lag screws by PowerPro, and this provides an extremely strong hold, and that's what we want, especially with a stair railing. And as I just showed you there, the easiest way to find this angle is to just trace a line on both sides, noting exactly what angle needed, and then just taking it to your chop saw and figuring out the appropriate angle from there. When installing all of your blocking, you do have to also account for exactly where you need the blocking to be. In my case, it's quite simple because all I have to do is make sure that there's blocking at the top and bottom, and then measure and determine exactly where our center point is to guarantee that we have blocking at the very center of our stairwell. In this case, our stairwell is six and a half feet long, and no span between post to post should be more than four feet long. Just keep that in mind. There might be a couple sections of blocking that you still need to remove based upon where your landing meets your stairwell, but that's easy enough with a reciprocating saw and we can move on to some framing. The railing that we'll be installing has a post base of 4x4 four four inches, and that means that the 2x4s that we have installed right now is not going to be enough support for those post base, which is why I'm ripping these 2x6s down to 4 and 3 quarter inch, and then installing that right on top of our 2x4s and our 4x4s. I use some 3 inch long Power Pro screws to secure this board to our 4x4 blocking and once that's taken care of all the way down, I can move on to the next piece. One thing I'm not discussing here is how I'm actually finding the proper mitered angle to connect these two pieces together perfectly, but that's only because I'm going into extreme detail about that later on in the video once we get to trim. This horizontal base plate is important to make sure it's perfectly straight, which is why I'm installing a few shims along the way and securing it down properly. Just make sure you're cutting the excess off flush with your framing with a utility knife or, in my circumstance, a multi-tool. 
And again, I do use my reciprocating saw to remove any excess so I have a perfect transition between the stairwell and our flat landing area. As I make my way to the second stair set, it's the same exact process, making sure that we have proper 4x4 blocking at the top, bottom, and middle sections, and then providing a proper top cap for this entire structure, which is made out of the 2x6 that we cut down to a 4 and 3 quarters. Now looking back, I should have removed this 2x4 as I was removing the wall, but I wasn't sure if it was going to be able to be salvaged, since at the time that we removed the half wall, we didn't know what type of railing we were going to be installing. But now that we know that we have to actually extend the base plate out to a wider width, it would have been a lot easier to do that ahead of time versus doing it when the flooring's already installed. But as you can see, we made do, we just had to be a little bit more careful, especially around this finished floor. As I installed the larger base plate section on the second floor, I quickly realized that the flooring was pushing one side of our base plate up compared to the other, and therefore I had to shim it up on one side. In a perfect world, I would have had a circular saw on hand to cut that flooring back just slightly, but I didn't, and therefore I just shimmed it up a bit as I installed our base plate all the way down. As I finish up installing our base plate all the way down, I can finally move on to some trim. Now the first trim is going to be a top cap that's going over this base plate. And an item to note is I'm actually using a plywood core that is paint grade. Most cheaper trim out there is going to be made up of an MDF core, which is why I'm going with a more expensive version, which as I just noted is plywood or in some cases solid wood. Now this may be a little overkill, but because I want to make sure we have a very structurally sound substrate that our posts are going to be secured to, then a plywood solid core unit is going to be much more structurally sound than an MDF. All of our trim is secured the same way with our finish nailer. Now we're using 16 gauge inch and a half long finish nails, which provide a lot of structural support and plenty of hold strength for this entire area. Once I have the top cap taken care of, we can move on to the sides. And this is where I'm going to show you the device that we've actually been using this whole time, which is this electronic angle finder that makes it so easy to find every single angle needed on this entire area. You basically zero it out and then use both sides of the ruler prong to determine exactly what the angle is. However, that does not give you the mitered corner. To give you the mitered corner, you have to take that measurement and minus it out by 180 degrees. In this case, we were slightly over 143, so I rounded it up to 144, minus it by 180, which gives you 36, and then divide that by 2, which gives you 18. By dividing it by two gives you that perfect angle for a mitered corner, and that's how I get every single miter correct the very first time. But also note that the miter at the top is going to be different than the miter at the bottom, which is why I clamp the top first and then make a mark exactly where the length needs to be. Then I actually figure out what the miter needs to be at the very bottom, so we have a perfect miter from one side to the other. At the bottom location, it did come out to 26 and a half, which is why I just extended it up to 27 degrees in order to make it simple on us all. I position our miter at the very top and then start nailing it as I go down. Now I am actually nailing it so it's completely flush with the top edge of our top cap that we previously installed. This I feel will give us the best professional look possible and the cleanest look possible in the end. Now that I trimmed up the first portion of our stairwell, I can move on to the second. Now this is going to be the same exact process and the same exact angles. And that's not what I was anticipating because most of the time you have to adjust those angles slightly here and there. But luckily for us, the layout of these stairs was exactly the same from lower stairway to upper stairway, just a little bit longer on one. As I make my way up to the second floor hallway, the one thing I suggest doing with your transition points is to actually cut them at a 45 degree angle. I find it provides a cleaner look and less potential of movement down the road. Once all your trim is fully secured and in place, you can then move on to some sanding. Now, there's not a lot of sanding to do at this point, but there might be a few high spots within your wood, which is why I take care of those first before we get to putty. 
And for putty, we are using Elmer's Carpenter's Wood Filler. Now this is a really good interior wood filler for a number of different reasons, including the fact that it dries fast, it's paintable, sandable, is less likely to shrink and crack on you, and of course it's easy to clean with some water. As for application, I'm just using a small putty knife to fill all the nail holes as well as all the seams along the side. And I do suggest working in small amounts because this material really does dry fairly quickly. These small amounts were already drying by the time I was finished with the application, so keep that in mind, especially when considering these long stretches and not working with too much material at once. It took me approximately an hour to do both the top and bottom sections of the filling process, but by the time I was done, I could go back to where I began and start sanding. That is how quick this product hardens up on you, and if you want to be rest assured it dries fully, you can always wait till the next morning and start sanding your process then. The sander I'm using is my Bosch Random Orbital Sander, and I'm using 240 grit sandpaper. It is a very high grit, but I do want to make sure that we're getting as smooth of a finish as possible. And if it takes me a little bit longer to sand my fill down, that's not a big deal to me as long as I have a perfectly smooth finish in the end. One key note with the sanding process is in order to avoid a very large mess and dust cloud, I have my sander hooked up to a shop vac. So every single time I turn on my sander, it also turns on the shop vac and starts sucking away the debris. At least the vast majority of all the dust is picked up with the shop vac and not spread across your house. But now that our sanding process is taken care of, we can move on to some paint. Now we're using a specific cabinet door trim paint, and there's plenty of paint you can choose from, but just make sure the paint that you're using is specifically for trim work. In order to strive for a uniform smooth finish, I'm going with a foam roller for the vast majority of the application, going across the top, then the sides, and then back over the top once more. This provides a very nice uniform application of paint and completely conceals the fact that this entire area was in disarray a very short time ago. I apply one coat of paint to all areas and you can apply a secondary coat if need be, but this was already paint grade so one coat was all I need for the application. As for the railing, I figured I'd divide this video up into two sections because not everyone is going to want a stainless steel wire railing, but the demolition, the framework, the trim work, and the finishing process can be applied to a large array of interior projects, which is why I divide them up. Please let me know in the comment section below if you would prefer them to be both in one specific video versus dividing up by two. But with that said, on this video, we are done. I always love how just moving a couple walls will completely transform the entire look and feel of a space, and that's exactly what happened in this application. Removing an old, outdated railing system was transformative of this space, and I cannot wait to show you how we installed this beautiful stainless steel wire railing in next week's video. But till then, this is still one truly beautiful, sexy beast. Oh yeah.